and realized we had the same battery in that diesel front end loader for five or six years, and it was still working. So I, I, when I buy batteries for my car, I go get uh, high tech, which used to be Voltec. tech. Right. tanks, whatever. Anyway, um, and I use them for battery banks now if I need to. I still have some of them. But also, I mean, I'm just going over some of your problems you're going to have and, you're, and things you learn by experience. Um, if you've got a battery bank, you've got an awful lot of electrical connections with not a lot of volts. And it doesn't take a whole lot of corrosion for your connections to stop working, or some of them stop working. And next thing you know, you've got a couple of dead batteries, and they take, tend to take down the rest of the system. And what uh, I did some work on an earlier combined heat and power thing that ran off of an automobile with a small engine. We called it a generator car. I did this for an outfit called Mad Housers, which built things for homeless people. We had a homeless encampment of uh, sheds we built, and we decided to get an electrical system in there. And there was a car there that was not running. Transmission had gone up, but the engine would run, so we converted it into a generating plant. And we ran it about five years, so I got five years' experience <coughs> running basically a CHP unit. And we got uh, there's a fellow there who's an electrical engineer, and he got uh, an electronics technician, rather. Let's see if I can plan my. See if I can find these files here. Let's see. I'm just in the Somebody know how to work this thing? I mean, I've got a computer, but it's 10 years old. It's not a laptop. I need to get the... Uh, well, I mean, it's in there. I need to get access it with the computer. The little hole there down at the bottom. I don't know if you're volunteer that just won the job. <laughs> Never had a laptop, so I don't know how to make this go. Okay, that's it. Okay, so there's a battery bank that we had in the back of the car. That wasn't so great. It, it screwed up the image. I got it. How do I go back? This has got some very generous feature where it helps you when you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do this one. I want to go back to the green car stuff. Okay. I want to do. 
will say Wolf 001. Try that. Okay, well, there's, there's the back of the car with the, with the batteries. With the batteries. This fellow here, that's where it's their electronic technician, and this Ben Atlanta, uh, he was killed a few years later. He tried to stop a robbery. Very brave guy, but uh, sometimes he didn't consider the consequences of everything he did. Now, what we did with this to make it worth his while to run it was we had a... Uh, tank and in it we put the copper coal and we piped the uh, gear hoses from the car onto this so where every time he ran it to charge the batteries he was getting himself 30 gallons of hot water and he would hold fairly decent jobs and uh, he had to wash up you know and he had to wash dishes and so on and he looked like a fairly civilized person in his homeless camp uh, with electricity and with the with hot water to wash in and so on. That was a CHP younger, but we learned a lot about batteries. And one of the things we learned uh, was how quickly the connections corrode. This is in Atlanta, and we said there's air pollution. Now, the churches were saying it was a chimera of humanistic science that there was air pollution, but we said there was. And we could see that if we left a copper pipe laying out, bright shiny copper pipe laying out overnight, and after the fog in the morning, when we picked it up, it would be black. The next morning, there was that much sulfur in the air. Uh, so what did we do to get soldering all the connections to the battery. All the cables we had to solder on the battery. There's a technique for doing that. We found out that that actually is common with buses where it used to be because they were burning diesel and there were buses basically every time they stopped were sitting in a cloud of sulfuric acid from vapor from the sulfur that was in the diesel fuel. And it's also a common thing with marine applications where there's a lot of corrosion from seawater is that the people have to you have to have your cables soldered on the battery. And I would expect, say, if you're doing something in Haiti, uh, which is close to the ocean, and just about just about anywhere you go, you probably would have enough salt dust in the air that you would have to do this, so you're going to have trouble making a, a battery bank work any length of time. And we, we, got, we got it so the uh, resistance in the circuit was about one one thousandth of an ohm. So it was, we had a pretty good, pretty good circuit. Um, <coughs> but if you're going to run a, a CHP unit that's only running a couple hours a day, a lot of times, like I said, the output you want is only about a kilowatt. It's a quite small unit. back up a photovoltaic in you know, a small scale photovoltaic and, and you really got trouble finding equipment that small and if you can't find liquid cooled engines that small Yanmar used to make one and that would have been close but they don't make it anymore everything you get now is air cooled so if you're going to recover waste heat it has to be done off the engine exhaust and if you're doing charcoal gas, it's going to be hot when it comes out of your gasifier, and you got to cool it, so you do another heat exchanger on that. So you're getting a fair amount of waste heat that you can use for uh, 
store in a tank, you know, like the 30, insulated 30 gallon tank that we had. It's a generator car. This, we got, uh, I've found that they've determined that the best fuel for these homeless people to be using for a lot of applications what was charcoal. And we've been doing that about 20 years. It was basically a third world setup in the middle of Atlanta. heaters for about $50 and they would run 18 hours. Oh, we could, okay, sorry about that. We got, uh, these heater units would run about 18 hours and basically the performance you get out of a pellet stove, it was six or eight hundred bucks and we could just do it with this very inexpensive heating unit. homeless folks were trying to light with, get light out of wick lamps and so on. And I realized what we had was close to a, a model for a third world village. And uh, oops, that's me. So, uh, I did was a very simple measurement. A very simple instrument that only cost a couple dollars. This thing is called paraffin block photometer, which you might use in a high school science experiment. And since I have determined the amount of charcoal, a charcoal burning generator would use, I was able to compare the light that put out with the light that was put out by a fire if you burn a similar amount of wood. Because I noticed that you could have a pretty big wood fire and you didn't have to get that far away from it and you're in the dark. I sort of realized the reason it looks bright is because of the way the human eye adapts at night. And it's actually not putting out that much light. It's just like equivalent to a 100 watt bulb or something like that. That's all you're getting. You're burning a lot of, a lot of energy. What you're burning is very ox oxygenated hydrocarbons, things like uh, carbon monoxide and so on, that really don't cast a lot of light. Now, uh, I determined the fuel consumption of a generator putting out one kilowatt to be about three and a half pounds of charcoal an hour, which came out to maybe 12 pounds of wood, 14 pounds of wood it would take to make that charcoal. <coughs> and after I ran the numbers, I found out that a charcoal fuel generator was putting out about 50 times more light than you would get from the same energy in a wick lamp burning kerosene, and about 500 times more light than you would get uh, from the same amount of energy in a form just of raw wood in a wood fire. And I, I, I've never seen those figures somewhere. I'm wondering why somebody else didn't do that. But it seems to me it has policy implications as to what we ought to be doing. Um, that... Uh, No longer have the, the data. 
flashy for now. But I, I ended up talking, publishing something in Orion Magazine about it. It was there I met Alan Page. products are sort of disadvantaged from remote areas, which meant, you know, people have to haul them on the back of a donkey or something to a village market, sell peanuts or something like that. What are they going to get for that? And then what have they got to pay for petroleum products that have been tremendously marked up? You're probably going through uh, a thousand times as much biomass to buy the kerosene as what it would be. What, you know, if you convert it to charcoal, what you would get in life, you know, equivalent life. So it's, uh, Can you explain the paraffin photometer? I, I remember doing this when I was a little boy, but I don't remember it. Okay. What it is, you got two blocks of paraffin and you got two equally reflective sheets of aluminum foil stuck between them. You know, because the aluminum foil got one dull side and one bright side. You've got to turn this so you either got two dull sides outward or two bright sides, so they're equal. And you just sort of stick this thing together by heating it and trying to weld it, you know, best you can. And it is, and then what you do is you lay it out on a tape. You put one light source at one end and another light source at the other end, and you move this thing back and forth. The, the two pieces of, of paraffin will glow according to the amount of light reflected through them. And it's pretty easy to tell. You can tell when you're getting equal illumination pretty closely for this thing. You know, plus or minus 5% or something. You know, you're not, you know, we're not, uh, after extreme accuracy, we're just trying to get a ballpark figure, you know, I mean 500 times, and that's fairly indicative of what's going on. Um, but anyway, you get this thing, you measure the distance to one light, you measure the distance to the other light, and you use what's called the inverse square rule. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But uh, from a point light source, the illumination from it decreases according to uh, the inverse of the square of the distance. But it's twice as far away, you're going to get a quarter as much light. You know, ten times as far away, you're going to get one one hundredth as much light. So, but not a pretty rudimentary calculation. fits in with rural electrification or rural energy is that uh, you know the big elephant in the room when they're, when they're starting the uh, symposium here and they're talking about biochar and increasing food production and all that kind of thing the elephant in the room was overpopulation which a lot of people are under political pressure not to say anything about Politically, you get a lot of trouble if you start talking about overpopulation. You got different countries that think it's genocide. You know, there's a lot of countries trying to practice genocide against the less developed ones and so on, asking them to limit their population. Um, you know, basically, we've maxed out the planet on people, and there are people who have rising expectations. And you know, we're and you combine that with global warming, and we're looking at some pretty awful stuff. In, uh, coming in the future. And see, I grew up around a, a military family. And we were in Japan during the occupation right after World War II. So I've ended up familiarizing myself pretty much with World War II. And some of that was an overpopulation thing. The Nazis thought they didn't have enough room. They were looking for Lebensraum. 
and they went into Eastern Europe to get cleared out of all these Untermensch, which I guess would be you and me, and uh, which they, you know, and so they executed literally millions of people, and um, until the suicide rate and the troops got so high, they had to start packing them in boxcars and shipping them back to concentration camps for ostensibly for labor. Um, the soldiers couldn't stand doing it. But, uh, and then the Nazi faithful moved into the Lebensraum. They've been cleared out. And then the Russians came back the other way. And they had all these columns of people, uh, vehicles jamming the roads trying to get back into Germany. Uh, and the Russians had these things called Sturmoviks. And uh, the columns never made it back to Germany. But they were attacked by clouds of Sturmoviks, and they were followed by clouds of vultures. And it was bad. And the uh, same thing happened in France and Western Europe. The Nazis went packing up to get back into Germany. And there was P-47s and P-38s that slaughtered them. And we had, so it wasn't just Nazis being bad boys. You know, they, they got theirs too. But, um, in Japan, you know, there have been four million civilian casualties in Japan. I mean, there are huge numbers of casualties. Uh, you know, firebomb raids and so on. When we were in Japan, that place was a long west show. It was a real mess. And Douglas MacArthur had his hands full. But this, this was an episode related to the Japanese were expansionist because their population was expanding. And that was kind of ended as for the time being as a solution to overpopulation, but uh, it sort of replaced it by increasing resource, resource consumption. Uh, now, I mean, you've got situations in Africa, like these million people that were killed in Africa, in the genocide in Africa. You know, they did it, you know, like in days of old when ice were bold, they just went in and hacked everybody up with machetes and spears. And I was talking to a friend who was from Africa, and I just read that, that, you know, they asked these people, why are you doing this? And they said, there's too many people. And I was, mentioned this to my friend from Africa, and he says, yeah, and he says, and they say, we didn't kill enough. So and that's where things are getting. So, um, if you start to throw climate change in there and a collapse of civilization in many parts of the world, <coughs> you know, you're going to be serious. And you know, I was talking to one fellow, uh, Christoph Steiner, who's from Austria, and I think he knows a lot of what happened. And I was saying, you know, we've got to either, we got to do something to try to bring this thing under control or you can either invest in biochar or you can invest in fast firing howitzers and 50 caliber machine guns and try to mow people down like corn, which was done in World War I and World War II. So we don't, um, there's a certain desperation, I think, in what we're trying to do. Uh, if you know the consequences of not doing anything. Now here's, let's see, charcoal make. Charcoal is really easy to make. I said this book listed 20, 30 different ways, and the guy said there were probably 100, but he tried to he hit the major ones. He also, uh, he also went into the Brazilian and Argentine charcoal industry. They produce a lot of steel with charcoal, with uh, wood burning. Uh, they make charcoal pig iron, a lot of it gets exported to Europe, which, which has its uh, requirements for biofuels. So they're make, sending a lot of their charcoal produced iron to Europe. And of course, some of it is coming from clear cutting parts of the Amazon. Some of it's coming from tree farming. I came across one document that put out the US government where we had tried to introduce tree farming into Haiti. Apparently with some success. So I don't know how much of the Haitian charcoal is coming from tree farming and how much of it is just coming from cutting the same area over and over again about every five years. But anyway, let's go to charcoal making. Let's see what I got here. 
I got error. Here's a retort uh, as part of Bob Hawkins' contribution part of the mine, and we're burning off the off gas from one retort to fire the other one, and then we're just sending up tons of off gas. As you can see, these white things on it are heat exchangers, and so we're harvesting quite a bit of waste heat at the time, and we're just doing it to condense uh, wood vinegar just to see what we're getting for, for wood vinegar. When you got, uh, we found out that we could do pretty well. Oops. The, again, the fellow from Africa showed us how to do charcoal and barrels. This is kind of a variation of the TLUD thing. We were originally doing basically that, and then found out we could do it in a barrel. Uh, just by leaning the barrel and angle, get the fire going, and after we had gotten it going, we would uh, we just walk around throwing wood in. We tip it back upright. Huh? You tip it back upright. You want it back? After you lit it, how? Do you no, you just take a shovel or something, hook it on the edge of the barrel, pull it upright. So you light it on an angle and then. Yeah, you start light it on an angle so the air will flow in and back out again and get the fire going pretty well. And then you just hook a shovel into the edge, pull it up right, and then take a dolly. I'd, I'd run seven of them usually. Um, let's see. How do you keep all of it going to ash? You just keep feeding it fast enough. So there, there's, I mean, if you, if you stop feeding it, it would burn to ash. And what we do, it's just a continuous feed thing where we go around. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's preparing wood for the dryer. The real important step in this is getting your wood dry enough. Your production of charcoal is almost proportional to how much water you've gotten out of it. This is the basic thing here. We'll just, just put a lid on the barrel. Cut off the air supply. And, uh, I just lost my... Here you go. six hours you can make probably 500 pounds of charcoal this way you're going to get about 80 100 pounds in each barrel and you just you have a rig of prepared wood you just walk around throwing pieces in and it's hot boring smoky work and it really helps to have a can of beer in your hand while you're doing it and it, uh, it's not for everybody you know, I always tell people they come with, with me, you know, you have a bucket of water there, and if they find their hair is caught fire, they need to stick their head in the bucket. <laughs> but, um, but when you get done, you got 500 pounds of charcoal, and you 
generator for 100 hours or 120 hours or something like that or, or run a, a hay stove we had for it takes about 10 pounds 12 pounds a, a go run it for a month so one day's work like this gets you about a month of heat with a hay stove to do just have a dolly and you pull the barrel out and you start putting them out and just pull one barrel back and group. And then what you do, the stuff is still burning, you just take it out of that barrel and flip it into others and you just keep moving the stuff that's still burning from one barrel to the next and, and uh, finally it's all burned up and you got them all sealed. And then you got about 500 pounds of charcoal. So that, uh, so I guess I haven't quite covered everything I wanted to, but then there's so much stuff. You know, okay, yeah. Now we got the uh, Frank. Deference to us other presenters. Guess what? Yeah. No. Deference to us other presenters. Can I? Can I request that um, you kind of yield some time for the rest of us? I, I can request. Yeah. Wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Until my time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.